Welcome, educators, parents, and scholar gamers to the Academy of Esports podcast. This is the podcast where James O'Hagan delves into topics surrounding esports and education. Esports are organized competitive video games allowing schools to redefine their athletic culture, diversify opportunities for student participation, promote physical and mental health, increase collegiate scholarship pathways, and play games. We can never forget the importance of play. The mission of the Academy of Esports is to support these ideals. The vision of the Academy of Esports is for all students to experience the fun and joy of playing competitive video games. Let's get started. Welcome everybody to the Academy of Esports podcast. I'm your host, James O'Hagan. And this week, I guess we could call it the book report week. Um, Over the winter holidays, I did take time to read a book around video games and violence. And you may wonder, what possible book could that be? Where could I get my hands on this book? The book that I read is called Moral Combat, Why the War on Violent Video Games is Wrong. And you may be wondering to yourself, uh, James, you might have lost your senses. Um, Don't violent video games tend to make people more violent. Well, that's what you might like to believe um, until you start to dig into the data and until you start actually digging into the research. It's always really important to just not take somebody's word for it. It's always important to, whenever we do anything like this, especially when we're talking about grand claims of of things that just happen to seem to make sense where on one hand and you have the other hand and then they seem to they should go together in the case of violence in video games yes on the surface you would think that those things would go together however as you read the book and as you look at the um the data sets and you look at the research that was done around violence in video games you start to realize that a lot of it is agenda driven is driven by the opportunities to gain some kind of um financial gain, whether it's through funding um, or actually writing materials or hubris by wanting to be on the news. Um, so it's important that we look at all of this in a, in a new light, considering especially that um, violence in video games have no direct effect on each other. Um, the grand way I could start this off is by saying that never has a scientist done a research study on violence in video games where the person who is a subject in the study has actually gone ahead and created a violent act uh, after playing a video game. So having committed, not created, but having not committed a violent act after playing a violent video game. Now the book is uh, one I would highly recommend reading. um, Especially those of you who are parents who are concerned about violence in video games. Um, If you're a student who happens to be listening to this podcast and you feel like you need some facts with which to back up your wants to play some video games, this is a great book to start. If you're uh, an educator who is being asked to do presentations to the board, this would be an excellent book uh, also to read as well. I learned so much from reading um, this book. And so I want some, I want to spend this episode kind of going through some of my big takeaways uh, with this material. I don't want to go through the entire book, but I feel like there are definitely some things that need to be addressed um, and talked about first and foremost when we're talking about violence in video games, because it is a very sensitive and a very difficult topic to discuss. There's been a lot of news in the past where there have been connections with especially things like school shootings um, and violent video games. But let's start to let's let's go into the big takeaways um, out of this book. Okay, so I'm going to go through my notes here. And one of the big um, takeaways that we have is that video games, whether it's violent or action or otherwise, um, don't make violent people. Okay. Again, you may be wondering, how is that the case? How, how is that even possible? Well, you have to understand that a lot of times when we look at violence in video games, we're looking at it through a lens of two things, really. 
Um, one of those uh, lenses that we as adults tend to look at things in video games is we have a sense of um, juvenoia, okay, is a term that's used in the book. Juvenoia is a term that's used and it describes a fear of youth. So we don't really understand what it is that the youth are necessarily doing with the games. And it's a common thing uh, for people to be scared of youth. In the 60s, all of a sudden, kids are starting to grow out their hair and wear bell bottoms. And that became something that was seen as rebellious um, and something that was scary. Uh, even in the 50s, when kids were listening to rock and roll music, that was seen as rebellious and scary. Uh, my generation, we were listening to Nirvana, um, wearing flannel shirts and uh, loose-fitting clothes, um, and that was seen as, as scary. So the fear of youth is nothing that is new. It's generational. It happens all over the place. But the other thing that we have a tendency to do is we tend to have a moral panic about things. So when we're talking about a moral panic, that is a uh, tendency to, of overblown fear. Okay, so we have a fear of things which can be blamed for real social problems. Uh, we, have, we, we have a tendency to use a scapegoat when we have real social problems. Um, I am an educator. I work uh, as the director of digital and virtual learning for the Racine Unified School District. A lot of the students that I get every day um, come to me um, needing an alternative learning environment. They just haven't fit well into the normal, quote unquote, normal school culture. And so um, I work with kids all the time who are misunderstood or who don't feel that they fit very well into, um, into school. And to chalk up violence in our youth um, to strictly something around video games um, I feel misses a much bigger picture and one why I really work hard to promote the ideals and the ideas of a scholar gamer. Um, giving kids not just games to play but other tasks and roles that they can have around gaming and video games because again it is such a large tent it is something that brings in kids who are very typically marginalized because maybe they don't play a musical instrument very well or they don't uh, see themselves as being ones who are athletically inclined in the traditional sense so baseball basketball football hockey those sports um, don't uh, appeal to them but they do like games they do like the sense of having uh, control over social media um, to do it in pro proactive and positive of ways. And that's something that's why I'm very big about bringing this into schools. So we have to avoid um, moral panic in our society uh, when we're talking about the fear of youth and what they're doing. Because that can also have a tremendous impact on the scientific community and the expectations of results in studies. You may think that when we do science um, and we do our studies that we do them in a vacuum and really these are people as well who have already their stereotypes and their tendencies to want to find a certain answer. So not everybody who does a peer-reviewed uh, scientific study may be doing it for the best of intentions, especially considering where some of the funding and the financing for some of these study, studies may come from. So it's really important that when we're looking at these studies that you don't necessarily take the news media's word for it whenever uh, something comes out and says um, that we have, that there's this uh, horrible connection between violence and video games. And so I will get into uh, a few more specifics about the studies in a few minutes here. But um, one of the things that we have to always be on the lookout for when we talk about these, these um, moral panics are the extreme claims, okay? So for example, an extreme claim would start with, and if you ever listen to CNN or Fox News or CNBC or read pretty much any newspaper sometimes. An example of an extreme claim that we need to be on the lookout for is one such as kids today are doing X younger. Ever heard that before in a news story? Or have you ever heard 
shocking new trend in youth behavior, or Tech X is having a profound impact on our kids' behavior. These are things that draw people to stories. These are things that are examples of a moral panic. Sometimes they may be the result of a single study that isn't even scientific, it may just be an observation that was made. I'm not saying that it's incorrect, but I'm also saying it's not necessarily correct as well. It's something that needs to be studied and examined more thoroughly uh, when we're talking about it, okay? And the data also that is presented in this, in this book uh, shares a, a much clearer idea that there is really no epidemic of real world violence associated with video games. I want to make sure that that, that sets in. There is no epidemic of real world violence associated with video games. It's an illusory correlation, as they call it. A false sense of events are connected. So an example that they give of a false sense of events that are connected um, is when we have in the summer, uh, the heat rises in the Midwest, um, you see crime rates go up and people have a tendency to say, well, because the heat rose, uh, that means that there's uh, more crime. Okay, that's an illusory correlation. Um, you could also make the same argument that because the heat is rising, um, and then you also have this claim of more crime, or this data that says there's more crime, you could also say though that, well, at the same time, ice cream sales are going up in the summer, okay? So then do we have the tendency to say, well, since ice cream sales are going up, ice cream leads to crime? We can't necessarily say that. There's more to a societal story than just that. We can't just say because the heat goes up, crime goes up, those are connected. Just like we can't say ice cream sales go up in the summer, thus an increase in crime must be connected to uh, higher ice cream sales. We cannot do that. Now, there's... Uh, there's an excellent um, um, graph that they have in the book um, because when we're talking about video game violence, the thing that is usually connected uh, to video game violence is school shootings. Um, when I was uh, first teaching, um, actually I was a student teacher, I was working at a second grade school in uh, Brookston, Indiana, Brookston, Indiana, just north of Purdue University, working with second grade students when the Columbine massacre took place. And uh, when the, when the um, investigation was done on the two boys who committed that crime, uh, where, when the investigation was done, what they found was is that the kids had a tendency to play the game Doom. And if you don't know what Doom is, Doom is a violent video game um, where they uh, the, the boys happen to actually reprogram the game, um, adding their own sprites um, and, and changing the game to, to meet their own personal wants and needs. Um, Sandy Hook as well is an example where video game violence was dragged into the conversation uh, as part of the investigation. Um, turns out though that the video game that the shooter in Sandy Hook um, the game that he liked playing was Dance Dance Revolution, and he would actually play it for hours on end. He wasn't playing, he wasn't focused in on violent video games. But they have here a build out of data um, that shows the characteristics of a typical school shooter. Uh, tremendously, almost 100% of those students are male. Uh, approximately 75% of those students who commit school shootings are bullied. Uh, about 80% of those uh, school shooters have suicidal thoughts or have actually attempted suicide. Um, over 85% of them are teenagers. Uh, about 60% of those students are depressed. Almost 100% of them are students. Uh, it could be a, in the case of a student who's maybe expelled, no longer part of the institution, so you wouldn't necessarily refer to them as a student. And then interest in violent video games. Of those typical school shooters, interest in violent video games only sits at about 15%, 10 to 15%, somewhere in there. 
So we can't necessarily make the claims and connections all the time that uh, violence and video games uh, go hand in hand. It, 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 the, there's nothing that really actually supports that notion outside of the illusory correlation, outside of people having the stereotypical belief that there is this connection between violent video games and violence, um, you, you can't make, you cannot make that connection. Sorry, you cannot. Um, the other big takeaway I have from the, uh, from the uh, book was um, really about uh, talking about addiction. And they, and they spoke a lot about addiction. And the reason why I, I came across the addiction section so much was because uh, we do seem to think that students are addicted uh, to games. But one of the things that really kind of um, triggered my, my um, interest in this section was how it started to talk about dopamine. Now, dopamine, I don't know if, if, every, if everybody here knows what dopamine is, but your brain works with chemicals, and those chemicals are released when certain things happen. In the case of dopamine, dopamine is released when you feel pleasure. So um, anything that would make you happy is going to release dopamine in your brain, and that will vary from person to person. One of the things that they, the claims are is that dopamine um, or excuse me, that video games are as addictive as heroin or as addictive as crack cocaine because uh, it releases dopamine. In fact, there was even a, a story on 60 Minutes, not uh, I believe it was December 9th, uh, there was an episode of 60 Minutes where they were talking about doing brain scans on kids and social media and the words dopamine popped up in the story. And it was almost like dopamine was being talked about in this really awful kind of evil way. Almost like we should be avoiding the release of dopamine. Well, guess what, folks? Video games are not nearly as addictive or release as much pleasure as, say, methamphetamines or amphetamines or cocaine or heroin or anything like that. So, for example, um, increase of dopamine levels by percentage. Okay, so if you take a methamphetamine, if you take methamphetamines, and you uh, get a release of dopamine, your normal dopamine level increases by 1,200%. Okay, that's an extreme high. Okay, that's why it is so addictive because you get these tremendous rushes of dopamine release. These pleasure centers of your brain are really overactive. Uh, amphetamines, you're going to get about a thousand percent increase when you take them. Again, there's a r real good reason why people get addicted to amphetamines. If you eat food, you get a dopamine release. You eat that cheese pizza. Oh, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of cheese pizza, but you eat cheese pizza. Um, you get a dopamine release, and that dopamine release will be, it's going to be about a 50 percent increase of normal levels of dopamine that are in your body when you eat food. So when you play video games, okay, so I've given you food, which is about 50% release of, of dopamine increase. Amphetamines is about 1,000%, and, and methamphetamine is about 1,200%. Um, video games is only going to, uh, as far as the pleasure centers go, is only going to increase your dopamine levels by about 100%, meaning they're going to double, okay? So it is nowhere near as addictive as... Uh, hard drugs. It's nowhere near as addictive as that. Um, so we need to, when we have the conversation about addiction, it's one that we shouldn't take lightly and it's one that um, we need to really understand what addiction is and what addiction means. Um, it, it, not saying that video games cannot be addictive in some way. There are addictions that you can have with, uh, with it. But um, we need to make sure that we're we're being um, uh, we're being uh, what's the word I'm looking for uh, responsible. That's the word I'm looking for when we talk about addiction. So things to look for in case you, you if you suspect that there's video game addiction, there's several things that we should be um, looking for. Okay, um, is there? Uh, 
salience, meaning is the degree to which an addiction takes over a person's mental life. And it has to be overwhelming. So is the salience to video games overwhelming? Is it, is it taking over their life completely overwhelming? Uh, is there uh, mood modification? Are video games the only way that they achieve a level of happiness? Um, is there a decreased level of tolerance, meaning they become less and less satisfied with what they enjoy playing? So by playing video games, they actually become uh, less satisfied from playing the games. Is there a sense of withdrawal? They become stressed to the point of not being able to enjoy the rest of life uh, if, they're, if they're addicted to games. Is there conflict? Does the person disregard negative consequences in their life from this conflict? Uh, that would be a potential sign of a video game addiction. Um, or is there a potential relapse? Revert to problematic behaviors despite efforts to change. I'm not saying you only have to have one of those things, and neither does the book say you have to have one of those things. But if you do feel that there is a video game addiction, you need to um, talk to counselors. School counselors are a great way to start uh, talking to people uh, about it. Um, your your uh, pediatrician may be a good one, but it's also important to realize that video game addiction shouldn't be taken lightly and it shouldn't be diagnosed uh, lightly either. Okay, um, You should go to a professional and a professional should be the one to make that diagno diag diagnosis. All right. Um, the other thing uh, to talk about when we're talking about uh, the big takeaways from this book, again, uh, the book is Moral combat great name of a book i wish i had come up with it myself um talking about again about the morality um of of things and the desensitization and the obesity um thoughts that are around um these games so when we talk about that i just want to pull up my notes here <clears throat> We actually find, and the data actually says, this is a big takeaway, is that in regards to morality, violent video games actually affect our morality, by and large, for the better. You may say, how does playing a violent video game actually make me a better person? Well, it's actually sh been shown that those containing the greatest violence impact our moral sensitivities. Greater moral reflection occurs when you're actually the bad guy. They've actually done a study. It's called the Milligram study. Um, and I'll put a link to it in the notes here. But what they actually found was that when you're the bad guy in a video game, um, you actually have a, a, a tendency to reflect more on the immoral behaviors. That actually makes you more empathetic about what's happening around you when you play a violent video game. And then there's also the, um, the thoughts around desensitization, um, so an increase of moral sensitivity is in stark contrast to perceived desensitization. That's an important point to make. That's an important point that is made in the book. Violent media may desensitize you to violent media, but it's not going to necessarily desensitize you to real life at all. Okay. We understand, um, the, uh, difference and people understand the difference. Most people, by and large, the vast majority of the population understands the difference between violent media and what is real life. And then the question of obesity, because I know that we talk about the stereotypes of gamers and um, sometimes that doesn't matter who I ask, where I go, what group I'm talking to, I always ask the question about, give me uh, an example of a stereotypical gamer. And uh, a lot of times they talk about the kid who's in the basement, uh, poor eating habits, unhealthy lifestyle. And what was actually found, because a lot of parents will say, hey, let's take the video games away because our kids need to go out and play some more. And what they actually found was that um, by reducing screen time, with kids, it actually had a minor impact on weight. Um, taking the game away doesn't necessarily mean um, that they're going to exercise. So just because you remove a game doesn't mean it's going to remove a sedentary lifestyle. Thus, we talk about again, the importance of the scholar gamer concept. That's why we talk about again, the importance of having an esports uh, team that is more comprehensive, excuse me, more comprehensive 
than just playing games. Because if you're just playing games, as I've always said, you're losing out on a big opportunity. It's no longer cutting edge for your school to have an esports team. It's cutting edge with what you do with it. That will do it for this week on the Academy of Esports. I've been your host, James O'Hagan. You may follow me on Twitter, at Jim O'Hagan. That's spelled at J-I-M-O-H-A-G-A-N. And through the Academy of Esports account, at T-A-O Esports. That's spelled at T-A-O-E-S-P-O-R-T-S. It's a great way to get the latest blog posts, podcast episodes, and news coming out of esports and education. And remember, you can continue your engagement by going to www.taoesports.com. You can also connect through Facebook at www.facebook.com slash taoesports. Thanks again for listening, and I look forward to our time again next week.